So good afternoon to those who are able to join us. Uh, I sent a request for solicitation for uh, areas that you would like us to direct our discussion to us. And some of the things that I got, uh, some said that, well, they've done the, the learning. So the problem is not about the knowledge, but how to apply the knowledge to respond to uh, questions. So for that uh, reason, the first thing I would like us to do today uh, before we do any substantive thing is to get into the, the rudiments of actually uh, answering questions and maybe we'll use the one essay uh, question from constitutional law as an illustration and probably one uh, question from contract or uh, or negligence probably as illustration for problem-based question uh, so that at our next session we take some substantive uh, topics and discuss. The opportunity is still there on the platform for you to indicate uh, areas that you're having rare difficulty and would like more discussion. Yeah, so uh, having said that, we know that the body responsible for the entrance examination effectively, uh, unless there have been changes that uh, I'm not aware, uh, what they've communicated to us publicly is that they are still sticking to the written type of examination. That is, you are given essay or problem-based type question. And I think they have done away with the multiple choice questions. So the emphasis is uh, how to test uh, your writing uh, ability, how you are able to uh, make use of the various things that you are supposed to have learned and be taught during your LLB uh, to respond to very uh, simple, uh, practical, oriented questions in the law, as the case may be. So we start with the essay type question. So all the time, what I say is that understand the question before you move on. But let, let's go to the example question I just put together before we come to the steps. So supposing you have a question like this, the increasing criminal prosecution of members of parliament in Ghana is seriously affecting the business of parliament, particularly having an evenly balanced number of MPs between majority and minority. A think tank, a think tank group, a think tank group known as Friends of Rule of Law is soliciting views on the constitutional implications on prosecution and possible conviction of certain MPs. These views will assist the group to decide on whether to go to Supreme Court for constitutional interpretation or simply push for reforms of the constitution. Submit your memorandum to the group. Yeah, so of course, this is, I just made this question up just uh, five minutes ago to the start of the class. So assuming you have a, a question uh, like this, typically, this is an essay. It's not a problem-based question. So that's why the fact that uh, it seems to be a little bit uh, long, going into about two or three sentences. It's still an essay question. It's not a problem-based question. It's not a problem-based question because we don't have any particular uh, fact pattern uh, on basis of which we can do what is usually done in problem-based question as in you know, generating issues and all that. So this is uh, typically essay question. So let's keep that in mind. We come back to this. Uh, then I'll take your views on how to you know, resolve this. But then let's go back to the mechanics, the practical steps. So uh, in dealing with essay question, as I said, first understand exactly what the question is inviting you to do. You must understand the, the task. The essay question is work, which you have been set. So what exactly are you called upon? What exactly are you invited to do? You must be clear in your mind. Since it's an essay, not until you understand exactly what the question is, 
the risk, the high risk, there's a rare likelihood that you are going to deviate. You are going to deviate. So let us uh, keep that uh, in mind. Now, uh, having understood what the question is really asking you to do, I propose that you move to the next stage. Jot down your ideas, right? Jot that, that is put down your ideas. As and when you know, the ideas come, don't waste time to try and get the ideas properly arranged in your head before you put it down. No. If you do it that way, there is the risk that an idea may escape you. So after understanding what the question is asking you to do, just get onto your answer booklet. You can just write, uh, you can have a question write rough work, right? Rough work or answer planning. And when you finish, you just drew one line across it because that is not part of the answer. But at least it will give the examiner also a sense that you actually uh, plan you know, your work. You didn't just do anything. Because I know, I, I think usually you are not allowed to write on the question paper because of the risk of you no know, people uh, giving their question paper to others and you have this uh, serious uh, incidence of examination or practice. So it is not wrong for you to use part of the answer booklet for your rough work. All that you have to do is that you cross it out so that your markers or examiners will know that uh, that portion is not what you are presenting as an answer, but it was just the pre-answer as it were. Good. So as I said, stay two. As the ideas come to you, on that, just put them down. Forget about the order, whether this will come first or that. No, that's not important, right? There's no need for order or coherence at this stage. It's not important at all. Because the ideas will just be flowing. So just put them down. Now, when you are done, of course, this thing I'm talking about, it shouldn't take more than, uh, no, it shouldn't take more than five minutes, right? And the, the good thing about essay is that if you understand what the question is calling you to do, and if you have planned your answer in terms of having the points and everything, developing them is not a problem. You will definitely be able to develop all the points before you move to the next question and you'll be within time. Now, the time will not be enough where you ignore this useful advice and then we just start writing. And then as you are writing, you get to the middle of the answer and something you think should have formed part of the introduction will come and then we still find a way to weave it in and then you are just on and on and on. And then you are all over the place. So that is the challenge. So let's follow uh, this uh, sequence. So uh, uh, the step three, look at the ideas or points you jotted down earlier and rearrange them in logically coherent order. I mean, I've, you know, I've, I've taught and I've been examiner uh, before. I've also talked to examiners and when it comes to logical presentation of ideas, it is non-negotiable. No matter how great your ideas are, if they are presented in a very haphazard way, you would definitely you lose a uh, important part of the max because uh, the haphazard nature of the ideas will affect understanding of what you are trying to do. So, so please, the third stage, you go to the, the ideas we just jotted all over and then arrange them logically. In other words, every essay must have a structure. Uh, you have the ideas, you, you arrange them, which one 
needs to be discussed first, what next, and so on and so forth. Which idea should go into the introduction? The introduction of an essay uh, question, or among other things, depending upon what sometimes some people will include definition of a key ideas in the in the in the essay question, as it were, if that is uh, how the question is is what about the idea, and then uh, some ones will go ahead and give a, a roadmap of the answer. Just uh, in a very succinct, concise way, just let the examiner know that uh, these are the you know, what I'm going to do. So in the introduction, the reader gets understanding of your understanding of the question. The reader gets understanding of uh, what exactly, in a very brief way, you consider necessary to be done as a complete answer to the question. So that is like the roadmap. So that is what the introduction is supposed to basically do. So you do the, the arrangement of the, the points, as I said, in a logical uh, order, so as to ensure coherence. Another uh, advice with respect to the uh, essay type question is that, the use of uh, uh, authorities, okay? Don't forget that what we are doing is law exams. It doesn't matter how the question appears. For the essay question in particular, as for the problem or the, those type of question, it will be obvious uh, most of the times you. But for the essay questions, there could be some uh, detractors or red herring. You will read like the question. And sometimes the question sounds so general, right? It sounds too general that you may be tempted to think that, uh, oh, that's what this one is not law. They just want you to just say anything. No. Remember that this is this is not entrance exams to LLB at University of Ghana or uh, KNUSC or UCC or uh, Central University, Presbyterian University or GIMPA or UPSC, as it were. No, it's not entrance examination to those law faculties. Entrance examination to those law faculties, we know that you haven't learned law. You are now coming to learn law so we can understand uh that even if a question is set and a question uh looks legal we don't expect legal response because we haven't learned law yet okay but this is post llb right you, you'll be giving the llb the bachelor of laws degree you'll be given a degree in law already and you are going to the next phase of your legal education and for that matter when a question is given you regardless of how the question appears, even if, if it, it looks like a general social uh, you know, discussion or religious discussion or cultural, economic, or even political, that is not the focus. You should bring on your legal thinking uh, uh, cap, put on your legal uh, uh, lenses to look at the, the problem because uh, your examiner knows the audience it is dealing with in setting the question. The, the, the audience for the examiner in this type of examination are people who have learned law and they have been certified as worthy of being conferred with a Bachelor of Laws degree. So keep that in mind. Good. And for that matter, you need to use authorities in your answer, right? You need to use authorities in your answer because essay questions may either require you to essentially to either uh, trace or explore historical development of a particular legal principle or concept or doctrine. Or it may require you to give out like an exposition of the position of the law, right? 
regarding a particular matter. What is the current position of the law? Just exposition. Just explain the position. And if you explain the position, don't forget that the law is not in vacuum. Article 11 of the 1992 Constitution is not there for nothing. Sources of law in Ghana. What that means is that anything you are talking, anything legal in Ghana, uh, for what you are saying to be legal, there must be something from one of the sources. Either the Constitution uh, supports what you are saying, or provision in Act of Parliament to, uh, support what you are saying, or provision in setting the greater legislation somewhere, be it constitutional instrument, legislative instrument, bylaws, or there's a, a judicial decision, decisional law, case law from the superior courts, uh, which supports what you are saying. If you cannot uh, get support from any of these uh, materials, as alluded to in Article 11, then uh, what you are saying or discussing, seriously speaking, is not law. You're doing something else. So authorities must be used in your essay questions. And authorities too, we must be mindful of hierarchy of legal norms. If what you are discussing in an essay, there is a relevant constitutional provision, you shouldn't ignore it. Because you should know that the constitution is the supreme law of the country. And if he says something that is more important, it should be you know, acknowledged first before any other uh, lesser uh, you know, source of legal norms can be appealed to or can be uh, used. So let's keep that uh, in mind. Now, and then in terms of constitutional provision and statutory material, uh, students are generally all right when it comes to uh, using them in essay questions. The challenge uh, st some students face uh, has to do with the use of uh, case law, that is the uh, decisions of the court, in substantiating their claims or assertions. Now, where you are writing an essay and you need to be using authorities, it is not a requirement for you to be telling us in detail about each of those uh, cases that you are using. No, you don't have to be that detailed. There are even at times that uh, just knowing that this position of the law was actually uh, stated or enunciated in this case will suffice. And it is not necessary for us to tell us the facts of that case, right? I'm talking about essay question. Don't get me wrong. When we come to problem-based question, we tweak this advice a little bit. But for essay type question, you don't need to be telling us in this, this happened, this happened, this happened, this happened, then the course said that and so on and so forth. No. It is only where maybe you, you, you've made a particular point and you think that because of a certain point you are trying to put across for a certain higher level of emphasis, you want to use illustration from a case law, then that one is different. Otherwise, most of the times, when you have to use case law in your essay questions, you are not required to tell us uh, you know, in details about, about, about those cases, no. So let us keep that uh, in mind. Then the other uh, advice I want to give with respect to essay questions is the use of appropriate linkages to connect points or ideas, as well as paragraphs. Don't let your essay question appear like writing uh, notes, okay? Like writing notes from a lecture or from a class. Uh, and as you, you notice, uh, notes from a class or lesson uh, often appear 
disjointed and there is no effort to let them uh, dovetail or link into one another as it were. But remember, this is a essay question you are doing. And don't forget that you are in competition. And one of the important competition, I mean, in your life, as far as the next phase of legal education is concerned, because uh, we don't have, or the law schools do not have space. They don't have, they, they don't have the space to take everybody. That one is a fact. Assuming we have 3,000 or 4,000 students, the fact of the matter is that they cannot take everybody because they don't have the space, they don't have the resources. So there's a limit to their capacity. And what it means is that some would not get the opportunity, others will get. But you should be one of those who get the opportunity. And that means that you must get more marks when your answers have been assessed. Because you don't look at people's faces, you don't look at people's names, you don't look at the schools that people attended. Whether you went to KNUSC, you went to UCC, you went to Legon, you went to UPSA, you went to Presbyterian University, Central University, Mount Crest, uh, name it. We don't look at that. It's the numbers that you're looking at, the index numbers. And you want to score more marks so that you stand above the crowd and be counted among the those who make it to law school uh, in 2023, 20, 24 academic year. And what that means is that you must bring some thoughts into how you answer essay, you no know, uh, uh, question answer is presented. Let your answer flow. Let your answer flow so that the markers will fall in love with your response, with your answer. You find it sweet. And then they, they, you become like the, 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 talk, the topic for discussion when they go for their lunch or their dinners, right, during the marking uh, retreat. Present your essay in a form of like a storytelling, a storytelling as it were. You know, let it flow. So that kind of sequence, sequencing, you know, coherence, let it flow. And you have to use uh, what you call like the linkages or the connectors. So we let a paragraph uh, be linked to, you know this already. Uh, next, furthermore, above, also, uh, in addition to this, and so on and so forth. So let your, you know, your, your essay uh, flow. And, and you can get this thing done by using these uh, linkages. And as I said, if you have actually planned your answer well, you've arranged the, the points well, in logical order, you have a good introduction, you told us in the introduction what you are going to do and all that. You will notice that your answer will become like some kind of like a, a story. It's like a story te uh, telling. Now the sixth point is that, maybe let me, before that, let me also add this. Uh, some of us, we, we still not pay attention to article paragraphing, right? At least from my uh, village uh, uh, elementary school, we are told that a paragraph contains uh, an idea. A paragraph contains an idea. So if you have an essay, as they say, one idea, one main idea, one paragraph, one main idea, one paragraph. So let us keep that in mind. A paragraph has got like a, a topic sentence or a thesis a statement. And then you develop that in that paragraph, right? Now the sixth uh, point is that uh, you need to be uh, discursive. Uh, being discursive, uh, even if the question is framed in a tempting way to be narrative or merely expository. Now, when you are being discursive, you have the opportunity to display that you are doing critical thinking because uh, being discursive means that you are actually thinking forward and backward about the, the, the question. 
and you're able to, you know, the points that you have organized, as you explain them, you're able to even like they raise uh, questions and then answer the questions yourself. That kind of like a rhetorical uh, questions. It's not for like the examiner, but then you raise it and then you answer it. Then you're able to uh, sometimes also raise uh, uh, some uh, issues which uh, you you think would even affect a particular uh, view, uh, which uh, will have been expressed regarding the question and so on and so forth. So that way, you, you've shown evidence that you are critically thinking about the question. And that is uh, more impressive than where you just do the, the poetry reciter, like the, the narrative, right? And we just uh, just put everything just there. So we'll be discursive. And as I told you, you are not a novice, right? You are not beginners. We've gone through three years, four years of Bachelor of Laws education. And your respective universities have actually certified that you are worthy of the degree. And we take you uh, for that. And that is why you need to show maturity in your answers. Your answers will not be marked with uh, you know, compassion for a first year student, right? What do I mean by that? A first year student writing exams in constitutional law, contract law, Ghana legal system, and sometimes a criminal law can make certain slips, right? In terms of appropriate legal lexicon or language, it can be pardoned and say that this person is making a transition from a secondary school or from some program into law. So over time, he or she will be all right. Now, at this stage, you've gone through the curriculum. So you will not be excused, you will not be pardoned. And in fact, your examiners are looking for opportunity to just uh, reduce the number. So if you give the, you know, you make it easier for you to be marked down or just for, you know, just a mass, just be put down there, your, your script is dropped. That is not good. So please uh, take uh, this uh, piece of advice I'm giving seriously, right? Good. Then uh, the last but one point is the uh, conclusion. Conclusion. This is uh, an essay and you cannot uh, write an essay without uh, concluding it. Conclusion means that you're pulling uh, the loose ends of your discussion together, and then you provide a definitive response to the question. So some who try and probably summarize the, the key arguments in the conclusion, and then they provide like a, a definitive response to exactly uh, what the question uh, asks about and so on. But at least there should be evidence that you made effort to conclude your answer. That is important. Finally, uh, time management. You don't have, excuse me, you don't have the whole of the day to actually uh, write your answer uh, as it were. You have a very limited uh, uh, time. So uh, unless I am, I don't know, uh, can anybody remind me, is it one and a half hours or two hours? What is the duration for the paper? One hour. No, or no. I think 90 minutes. 90, 90 minutes. minutes. All right, good. 
Good. So 90 minutes. So that is a uh, 45, 45. Good. And you are usually given two questions, right? The point to remember is that the questions carry equal marks. And what that means is that if you decide to uh, use more time for one question at the expense of the other question, now let's suppose each of them is being marked over 50, right? So all together 100. If it's 50, 50, no matter what you write for the question that you decided to spend uh, 60 minutes, and then you leave only 30 minutes for uh, the other question. The question you spend 60 minutes, I can bet my last uh, Ghana peso. You will never get 50 over 50. I'm sure about that. And I know what I'm talking about. And assuming you even got 45 over 50, right? In that question. And you are not able to look at the you know, the difficulties. You know, where there are times that we we are told that the examiners will you no know, the, the board will decide uh, the pass mark or will decide whether you have to pass both questions. You know, I remember there have been times that you say that you must pass both questions before you can actually what you can pass, and then so on and so forth. So don't allow your person to depend upon uh, post-release of results discussion, which will go on at the General Legal Council or at the uh, examiner's board before you know your fate. No, do the writing. So the writing is that you must pass both questions, right? So divide your term equally between them. Give each question 45 minutes. If you finish question one and you move on to question two, you are fully finished question two and you still have a lot of time. And you think that uh, you need to go to uh, question one and do uh, what we call like a, a postscript, right? And maybe like you've concluded, but there's certain, I, because you have more time and some ideas came. You go under your answer and then you write like the post uh, script, you underline it, and then you develop it. That is fine, at least. Uh, your examiner, will, once it's on the script, will look at it. But you have done justice to both questions. So let's pay attention to that. Before we, we look at the, the, the sample question, I just created. I would like to take your comments or your questions on what you've done. Yeah, if you want to speak, you just just make sure the only one person is speaking at a time. You just speak. Okay, so there's no question. Now let's look at the this question. I created this less than uh, five minutes before we started the class, so don't ask me for answer. And it's not from anywhere. It just uh, people like a uh, uh, made up, right? The increasing criminal prosecution of members of parliament in Ghana is seriously affecting the business of parliament, particularly having an evenly balanced number of MPs between majority and minority sides. A think tank group known as Friends of Rule of Law is solicit soliciting views on the constitutional implications on, on prosecution and possible conviction of certain MPs. These views will assist the group to decide on whether to go to Supreme Court for constitutional interpretation or simply push for reforms of the constitution. Submit your memorandum to the group. 
Yeah, so let's say you have this as a as a question. Let's follow the steps that uh, we've there discussed and let's brainstorm together to get some uh, ideas. Yes. So let's say we, we the first stage, we say we need to understand the question, isn't it? We need to understand the question. Uh, I presume that you've understood the question. What the question is exactly requiring of us. I presume we've all understood that. Good. Now let's move on to the next one that we have to just randomly jot down ideas. I mean, as they come to us. So let us do that now. Yes. Yes. Yeah, so what are the ideas? Quickly. What are the ideas? Are you here? Yes, sir. We are around. <laughs> yes, yeah, so let's hear you. I mean, I said the at this stage, just forget about the order of the ideas. Just anything which comes to your mind. So let's do that. Hello, sir. Yes, uh, we know the question is basically on the effect or implications of prosecuting a certain MP and conviction. Okay. And so we need to discuss the procedure to ins to bring an action against a certain MP. Uh, and we are we know that when the MP is going to Parliament you cannot, you have to pass the rate through the Speaker of Parliament. And we also know that if a conviction is successful, the MP loses the seat automatically. And we also know that the effect is that that seat will be declared vacant and our election is organized within 21 days, 28 days rather. So these are some of the points I, I remember of head. Okay. I, I hope uh, you, you put them down. Somebody should be like the secretary. So, okay, you said yes. What did you say? Let, let, let me write it. Somebody has said immunity of MP uh, in the chat. What else? Oh, let, let me create a space here. Yeah, so that's the planning answer. Good. Uh, so I just brought in the ideas. Uh, yes, let's try and capture what Charles said, and then uh, uh, Vivian will come in. Charles, let's take your ideas quick in, in points form. Just yes. Uh, I, I said we need to discuss Article 17 one equality before the law. Then we also need to discuss the procedure bringing an action against a certain MP. Okay. And that is yeah. with regard to the immunity. Bringing action against certain MP. What is the Immunity, okay. Then the effect that if the, the prosecution is successful and the MP is convicted, his seat is declared vacant. Set of conviction. And an election is organized within 28 days to replace him.
Okay. Okay, so your, your points are finished. So let's go to Vivian. Let's, yes. Vivian. Yes, sir. Uh, I think uh, in addition to what he, he has said, I think uh, at the introductory part, we should tackle the, what exactly is criminal prosecution. And then we distinguish it uh, uh, between the, the criminal prosecution as well as the civil prosecution. So that that will be our introductory part before we move on. Then when we move on, as he said, uh, equality before the law, we work on that one too and continue the process as he has said. Then if we are recommending a reform, I think um, what type of reform we'll be looking at. If we are re recommending a reform, the reform that we are looking at, then we talk about it. Thank That's you. All right, thank you, Vivian. Yes, uh, any other? Any other points at this stage? We are just yes, Ambrose. I just uh, jotting down ideas as they come. Ambrose, go ahead. Hello, sir. Yes. Yes, I mean, sir. In addition to what my colleagues, in addition to what my colleagues have said. I also think that in the introduction stage, uh, we talk briefly and uh, the effect of the criminal prosecution and who is in charge of prosecution when it comes to uh, Ambrose, have you finished? The limitation of powers of the arms of government. That would be brief. You said limitations of what? Well, no, no, no. Yes, sir. Okay. I think I, I, you are, you... I'm saying that. Yeah. Hello. Yes, I can hear you. Nice one. Your network is not great. Uh, okay. Uh, sorry. Yeah, hi, yeah. So come again. I, I heard you. Are, you are sorry. So, yes, you said that the last bit. I didn't get that. Uh, the last part. I was. I was saying that you talked briefly about constitutionalism. That is the limitation of powers of arms of government and the government agencies, yeah. and also the prosecutor, uh, prosecutor, uh, prosecution authority. Of the state, i.e., the AG who is in charge of prosecution of uh, people who commit criminal offenses in Ghana, and the effect of the prosecution. Yeah, we've, we've captured that already. Okay, all right. Thank you. Uh, is there any point uh, anybody has? Yes, uh, Paul. Good evening, sir. Uh, I think we, I also take this approach. I will first of all look at uh, the main fact that there is an increase in uh, Yes, there is an increase in what? Hello. Prosecution of them sitting and presented. Okay. Hello. Yeah, we can hear you. Yes, sir. So I said I will I will take a look at the fact that there is an increasing rate of uh, in 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 so far as uh, sitting MPs. Right. MPs are uh, are concerned. Then I also look at the fact that um, there is. Um, there are constitutional immunities for for all those MPs, and I'll go ahead and discuss 
what what they are and i will analyze the, the fact that the, the, there is a reason for why there is uh, uh, there is immunity for this city name uh, please, please put your, your mic off. Okay, anyway, we've taken uh, enough uh, suggestions. So now, just my initial comments. The points which have come out are great. But then some of them also suggest that uh, we didn't take the first step serious. The first step we discuss is that we should understand really exactly what the question is requiring of us, right? The question properly understood. Properly understood. First, if we look at the constitutional position, on whether a certain MP can be criminally prosecuted. Is there any controversy in terms of proper understanding of that on, as far as the Constitution is concerned, that the first point? If the position is clear, but having regard to post-enactment development, that is, the constitution has come into force for almost 30 years, and we actually see that this particular aspect of it, MPs with every change in government and all that, the new government will have opportunity to look into the activities of the previous government, and uh, they will come to the conclusion that some wrongdoing might have occurred. So let us uh, take that through the, the criminal uh, uh, justice system to find out whether crime has been committed or has not been committed and all that. And invariably, all the people who may be prosecuted in that respect may be certain uh, MPs. So the constitutional position may be clear. However, looking at the, the and that is where and that is where the 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 second part of the question. Because the question is in two parts. The first part, is there a need for constitutional interpretation regarding uh, prosecution of certain MPs and also uh, effects of conviction on their position as certain uh, MPs uh, as it were? So that is a, a one aspect. And then the other aspect, if, of course, depending upon how we answer the first one, if uh, we say that, yes, there's no problem as far as the constitutional position is concerned, it's well understood, there's no ambiguity, there's no uh, a case for constitutional interpretation, then the next thing is that, yes, the constitution is clear, but then the reality is this, that we can get a number of MPs who are being prosecuted at the same time, and prosecution is not one day. It takes a couple of weeks, couple of months, and all that. When cases are, are being tried, the MP definitely will have to uh, come to court, so long as he is a accused person, and all that. Mm. So you reflect on implication of that for the work of parliament. And the question is, would you consider it necessary for the constitution to be reformed in that respect? 
So it is this kind of understanding that we should have uh, before we put down the points. So if you have this understanding, the points very simple. So uh, first, uh, the first one actually is we having the knowledge of the constitution. What are the relevant provisions concerning uh, a certain MP uh, who can be criminally prosecuted? What are the relevant provisions? We need to know that. And then we also need to know the outcome of the criminal prosecution. If there's a conviction, uh, how does that affect the position of the MP? As, as in charge or one of uh, the contributors uh, in, uh, stated that they seem to be declared on, uh, vacant and all that. So the first bit is actually testing our knowledge of the constitutional position regarding these matters. And then the second bit is inviting us to take uh, what do you call like a, some kind of like a stand or to discuss whether uh, there's a need to move away from the constitutional provision, make some changes because of certain things. So that is where we'll be doing a lot of the thinking. And some of you have started talking about equality before the law. Uh, some are also talking about uh, who has the power to do criminal work. Uh, prosecution. Uh, some are also talking about uh, implications for separation of powers and so on and so forth. So all those ideas uh, where you conclude where you conclude that uh, there is a, a need for reform, then that is where you have to build like the, 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 the discussion uh, as it were. So I've given you some uh, general clues, but I would like you to think through the question and on your own, uh, try and develop uh, an essay, right? Try and develop an essay. Uh, you are many, but if you put it on the platform, I'll look at some of them and then uh, comment on uh, some of them for you, even if not all. So after putting the points down like this, as I said, the next thing is we need to arrange them. Uh, which one uh, goes where, which one goes where, and in which order. So in this particular case, I've talked about the fact that we are looking at two scenarios. The first one is really about uh, we knowing the constitutional uh, position regarding whether a certain MP can be criminally prosecuted or not. And the answer is uh, yes, isn't it? Except that when it comes to uh, criminal summons and so on, there are some uh, privileges. If the person is in, uh, a, you know, is actually within the recent of uh, parliament, as it were. So if you look at this provision of the constitution, for example, let me just put this thing here. I just copied this from the constitution. These are not the only ones, but for example, if you look at article. Uh, one one seven, we notice that a criminal process coming from court and so on shall not be served uh, in relation to any MP while he is on his way to uh, Parliament or returning from Parliament and so on and so forth. I mean, you uh, look at the the, the other uh, uh, provisions. Uh, as uh, it were. So you can try an answer, right? You can try an answer on your own and then we'll look at it if you put it on any of the platforms. Okay, so we'll leave the essay questions and then go to the last uh, aspect. And as I said, I'm doing this because uh, some of you said they still need assistance. That's why we're doing this. Any question on the essay before we move on? Okay. okay, let me uh, give you a certain uh, question from negligence, which will 
be used as an illustration for our discussion of the problem uh, type as it were. So just a second. I think I'm giving you just a question. Just a second. Hi. It's a bit lengthy of a problem, but don't worry. Oh, no. Yeah, okay. Okay, so uh, having uh, revised and also shared important uh, ideas on how best to answer a C type question. We now turn our attention to a problem based question. It's possible, even in a particular year, to have uh, two problem based questions, or to have a two essay uh, question, or to have one essay and one problem. It's, I mean, uh, you know, everything is possible. So just get uh, ready. So if we have a problem-based question, uh, let me say this. I'll be saying it over and over, and I say it again, because it's uh, it's really important. Uh, please, if you if you are given a problem-based question, at this stage, nobody will smile at you if you ignore 
the well-known approach in answering problem-based questions. And the well-known approach in the common law world, not only in Ghana, any common law country, the well-known approach is what you call the IPAC or the IRAC, right? IRAC or IPAC, however you call it. The fact that there's a, a structured response. You identify area of law, you generate issues. You take each of the issues, you state the principles of law which are relevant to that issue. Then you apply the, the facts of the problem which are considered like the evidence. The facts of the problem to the principles of law as whether the facts of the problem actually uh, respond to what the principle of law is saying or not. Then you draw your conclusion on that, what is an answer to the issue, because the issue is a question. When you finish, you repeat it for all the other issues. Now, if you are answering a problem or scenario-based question, and you ignore this, and you just start talking, right? The content of what you are saying may very well be useful to uh, the demands of the question. Nevertheless, you lose significant marks because you chose to ignore the well-known path or approach for dealing with that. So let us keep that in mind. Apart from you probably being penalized, if you even put the, the penalization or the punishment aside, you are also harming yourself in the sense that by ignoring the IRAC or the IPAC, that is a structured way, you have a high risk of missing certain uh, issues or certain points which will have become obvious to you if you are decided to be very methodical or systematic and structured like the IPAC. So let's keep that in mind. And again, I dare say that you are not first year or second year law students. You are law graduates, right? You have LLB. So this is not the, the, the time that anybody is going to be sympathetic towards you and say that, oh, they are now learning, they'll get better. No, you have LLB. And LLB is an LLB. Regardless of what we learn, whether we did it in Oxford, you did it in where? It's an LLB. We hold you to the same standard, which is expected of a successful LLB graduate. And a successful LLB graduate is supposed to know how to use IRAC or IPAC to answer questions. So if you've not been, in case you've forgotten or whatever, you we have one month. You have opportunity to get back to it and practice. The skill is as important as the knowledge. Good. So uh, typically, uh, you have the, uh, what do you call it, the introduction. The introduction part of the, an answer to problem-based question will simply be uh, you mapping out the areas, right, concern, and then you generate issues. So introduction in a problem-based question is very straightforward. The function of it is for you to tell us what the area of the law is or what the areas of the law are, and then what legal questions, that is what issues, legal issues arise from the problem. So this is supposed to be outlined, not explain or discuss in the introduction. And having done that, you now take the issues one after the other. So you take one issue, 
you can write it uh, boldly so that will stand out or you underline it, okay? And then under it, you start outlining or stating the principles of law in a propositional form. Mind you, in dealing with a problem-based question, you are more or less uh, acting as a lawyer or a judge, as it were. You have a rare scenario. I mean, of course, albeit a hypothetical. You have a, a factual pattern before you. There are some uh, disputes evident on the face of it. And you are supposed to use your knowledge of the law to resolve it. So here, we are not interested in what the law was. When we are stating the principles of law, don't tell us the law was this, it becomes this, it becomes that. Tell us what the position of the law is now. Let me just give you an example. So let's suppose that uh, the question is about, let's say, consideration, and the problem is about consideration or something to do with consideration. We are not interested in what the common law used to be. Uh, in cases like Ruth Ledger's grant, who says that where an offer or promisor has promised to leave an offer open, unless the promisee has actually provided consideration, the offer can withdraw it at any time. That used to be the common law. But now, section 8, subsection 1 of the contract says this. No. We're not interested in what the law was. We're interested in what the law is now. On the other hand, if you were answering an essay question, okay, and the question has asked you to uh, discuss the changes or modifications which have been made to the common law doctrine of consideration by the Ghanaian uh, statute, then you can be telling us about the history and then the, the there and now, or then and now, or what the position was and where we are now, and we can do that. But for problem based, we are not interested in what the law was. We're interested in what the law is now. So let's keep that in mind. And I said that you have to state the principles in a, a propositional form. If I say propositional form, that is state the principle direct. Okay. So if it's like uh, negligence, for example, you want to probably talk about. Uh, uh, the plaintiff must show that the defendant owed him a duty of care. That is a right. A duty of care is held to exist where the neighbor principle, as stated in Donogu and Stevenson, apply. Or in another situation, as elaborated in the Kaparu against Wadikman case. So you see, you are stating it direct. Yeah, so that is what I mean by saying that you must outline the principles and then the corresponding authorities. So let's keep that in mind. Again, uh, stating the principles here said are the corresponding authorities. It is not at this stage that you are required to tell us exactly what happened in the cases that you've cited, no. Is not needed at the, the the statement of the relevant principles or outline of the principles stage. No, it's not needed at this stage. At this stage, all that we need is that you are saying you are saying a certain principle. We are interested in knowing where did you get that from? Did it draw from the air? Or that principle was propounded in a particular case decided by the court. That's what you're interested in. Okay. Now, after outlining the relevant principle on that particular issue together with the relevant authorities in which the case is emanated from, you move on to the next stage. That is application and analysis, right? You are going to apply the law to the facts. You are going to apply, and that is what makes the problem based uh, question. For essay, you don't have any facts. You are just speaking in abstract, just talking theoretical, the law. 
or how it has been, or how it should become, how it should be changed and all that, like the reform we're talking about. But here, we are dealing with a concrete scenario. So we are going to apply the law to the facts. I'm going to find out whether uh, any aspect of the facts can help us to conclude that this principle we have stated is actually satisfied, it's actually applicable to this case, to this factual pattern. And as you are doing it, and that's what we call like analysis, that is to say that you need to open up your understanding of the facts and then your understanding of the principle. And then you connect them or you link them for you to arrive at a conclusion as whether that principle is met according to the factual circumstances of the case before you or not. So let us keep that uh, in mind. Now, when you are doing that, it may well be that the case you cited in relation to a particular principle, the factual scenario in that case are just on force or are just uh, similar right, to the problem that you have before you. Now, where that is the case, then you have the opportunity to go to town and tell us in a little bit detail uh, what basically were the material facts in that case. And then uh, what did the court hold or what did the court conclude within the context of those uh, material facts? Okay, and then you are able to say that the conclusion or the inference that you are making is actually supported by this case where so, so, and so, and so, and so happened. On the other hand, there may be a case where the facts on the face of it look similar to the fact pattern in the question. And yet, uh, if you examine it more closely, you see some points of differentiation or distinction between what is in the decided case and then the first before you. So you can also do distinguishing. You can say that, yes, uh, although uh, this principle which has been stated and so, so, and so, and so in this particular case, uh, it is important to know that this case, uh, that case is not on all fours with the scenario here. And uh, that case can easily be distinguished because whereas in that case, uh, this and that happened, uh, here we notice that uh, that is not part of what we have. And for that matter, the court is more likely to uh, distinguish it from what we have here. So that is also another way of using the authorities. Yeah, so uh, you do this, uh, you know, of course, when you've done this, then the answer to the issue you are dealing with will become obvious because the issue is a question. The issue is a question and that question must be answered. So when you've done all this analysis and so on, then it will become clear for you uh, what the answer to that issue should be. You repeat that for all the issues. Then when you finish, you come and draw one big conclusion. So the conclusion, because don't forget, you're often asked to advise the parties or advise someone, or you're asked to consider the possible uh, legal action and defenses. Maybe sometimes that's what the question taskmasters may say. So in the conclusion, you need to uh, address that. So that will be like the one big conclusion at the end of the of the work. Any question on the approach? Any 
any comment or any addition? Let me put it that way. Hello, sir. Yes, Charles. Please, my issue is on the issues. Okay. If you have, say, four issues, and some, I don't know, the appropriate, are you to state all the issues immediately after the areas of law before you take them one after the other, which also means that it must waste your time. Okay. Or if Go ahead. Go or ahead. You, you, after the area of law that has been identified, you state issue one and discuss that one finish and go to the like that. I don't know whether it is uh, acceptable. Yeah, okay. Uh, thank you, Charles. Um, if you did it what the way you are suggesting, you are not wrong, okay? You are not wrong. However, uh, it is better if at the beginning of your answer, in the introduction, having identified or mapped out the relevant area of law, or sometimes in areas of law. And I have told uh, previous uh, 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 groups, like the last two, three, four years, we did this exam, that uh, having regard to the nature of the law school entry examination, the area of law is important, okay? The area of the areas of law is important because you are writing what do you call like a composite paper? You're not right. Excuse me. You're not writing a standalone uh, a law paper. How do I mean by that? That is to say that when a story is given and you are asked to advise or do anything like that, okay. Oftentimes, no one will say that this story. It's about law of contract. This story is about land law. This story is about criminal law. This story is about thought. And for that matter, approach it from law of thought. Approach it from criminal law. Okay? And as you remember from your learning of legal system and legal method, when it comes to the relationship between contract, thought, and criminal law, Sometimes we have a lot of uh, overlapping here and there. And for that matter, if you have a, a fact scenario, it is important for you to tell us uh, the areas of law that you have identified, okay? I remember a marking scheme may be made and the examiner has probably identified certain area of law. You will get a student who will do what the examiner has said. In addition to that, would also recognize another area of law, another issue, who the examiner did not even include in his or her marking scheme. And what the student has done will not be ignored, especially so if it is actually uh, sustainable, if it's maintainable, having regard to the, the story. To be looked at and to be given uh, some credit. But it, as I said, it is better to get your area of law, areas of law in the introduction and get all the issues, you know, line up there. And then you take the issue one after the other. Or sometimes uh, some issues may be related. And for that, for example, when you are dealing with, let's say, especially when it comes to area of like the contract law and also tort law, okay? If you are dealing with uh, something in the area of uh, negligence, for example, you may raise issue about uh, whether someone owed uh, someone uh, a duty of care, whether there was a sense of duty of care. And then you may also raise the issue as whether what the person did, he breached that duty of care. And probably we also read issue as to whether the death or the wound which the person has sustained uh, was caused by the breach of the duty of care. 
Now, some of these uh, issues may be related in terms of even the statement of the law. So uh, sometimes two issues may be treated together. You, you treat them together in the sense that you state them together uh, issue one, this issue two, that uh, these two issues due to their uh, uh, intrinsic uh, uh, nature of being related to one another, I propose to address them together. Now, the law is that you state the law on that. Now, when you finish and you are doing application analysis, then you can take uh, each of them and then having, and then you answer it, you know, that, that way. I don't know, uh, Charles, if uh, this helps you. Yes, sir, it, it, it does. Okay. Yeah, Justice. Yes, um, uh, good afternoon, my Lord. So I, I just want to seek a bit of clarification. Um, so I just want to use an example. So for instance, the set of facts that have been presented is one that um, is defamation. So you go on with your area of law, you state your issue. Now, when you come to the rules, there are certain principles that has to be, you know, you have to go through in order to be able to ascertain whether there is defamation. You know, was it published? Did it refer to the defender, uh, uh, to the claimant and all those things? So is it at that stage that you still have to take each of the factors that you have identified under the rule? So for instance, was it published? Then you go ahead to discuss what it means by publication. Or you just list them under the rules. And when you go to the analysis, then you can then pick up the analysis, what it means by publication, what it means by referring to the um, claimants, and then what it means by the word itself being defamatory. Okay. So I just want to seek a bit of clarification, then you apply. I just want to seek a clarification. All right. Thank All right. That's yes, uh, Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, that says your question brings up the issue as to whether we have a one size uh, fit all when it comes to problem based question. You see, the reality is that regardless of the particular area is being tested, oftentimes if you get the problem, let's say if it's defamation, uh, maybe the focus may probably be more on publication. Or it may be like probably the interpretation of the, the, the alleged uh, informatory uh, uh, words and so on and so forth. So as we read the, the, the story, and there are certain aspects of the relevant law, as we read the story, you notice that you don't have enough information to, for certain aspects. And that should tell you that that is not like the main uh, uh, focus. And we are not supposed to also uh, impute, right? Or we are not we are not supposed to add to the facts. You cannot read in uh, facts which are not there. The facts in the question are considered as all that happened. So if uh, you look at the, maybe there's a particular element of the particular area of law that you've identified and you are struggling, there's no, you don't have any uh, sufficient information which will help you to properly, you know, analyze and apply that. And that should tell you that that particular element is not like, if you like, the main uh, uh, focus, as it were. And avoid uh, creating your own facts. Maybe where the information is not enough, a good student will say that uh, since uh, the fact is silent on this particular aspect and all that, it is not uh, 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 possible to determine uh, whether this and this and that. So in that case, you have shown some awareness that yes, this element on the face of it appears to also be relevant. However, if you go into the facts, we don't have enough information for you to properly uh, say that whether it's applicable or it's not applicable and so on and so forth. 
So let's take, I think the, some have used the test to bring issues. Uh, okay, uh, could you, could the program question potentially include the two distinct subjects simultaneously, such as thought and criminal law? Okay, uh, and then uh, Valerie, uh, another one. Is it possible for program questions to be grounded in two separate law areas like thought, law, and criminal law concurrently? Okay, good. Yeah, so as I said, the type of exams you are doing is, is quite uh, tricky uh, when it comes to program-based question. As for the essay, uh, th there's no hassle because as you read the question, it will become uh, obvious to you that this is what the question is asking you to do. But the problem one is where we have the challenge because your examination rule says that you have been examined in six areas, land law, criminal law, constitutional law, contract, uh, thought, Ghana legal system and legal method. So if the question uh, comes, how do you know whether this uh, question is purely uh, thought or uh, the question is also about uh, thought and also at the same time about criminal law. Well, my advice is that when you read the story, okay, when you read the story, if you read the story well, it will become obvious to you what the particular subject area is. And even let's assume that the one which became obvious to you is, let's say, like the thought law, okay? And within that, you also get a certain uh, prompting that, uh, I mean, causing unlawful harm is also something uh, in criminal law uh, the person can be uh, charged with and so on. And now you know the law in terms of the constitutive ingredients the defense of causing unlawful harm and all that. Now, if you look at the facts and you have enough information for you to discuss that charge, there's nothing wrong having uh, discussed the thought aspect for you to also uh, you know, address that uh, criminal law aspect that in your considered view, enough information exists in the question for you to uh, answer that. As I said, the bottom line is that do you have enough information in the question? Not just because uh, you just saw something you know, tiny, then you just jump to conclusion that, oh, okay, then this is also a criminal law and so on and so forth, or this is a uh, contract, or this is thought. Or, so let's keep that uh, in mind. But as I said, if I've read the story well and you are able to see two subject areas as being the re relevant area, please don't uh, be afraid. Be courageous. Present uh, the two which you have seen and just make sure that you uh, you discuss them as you have been discussing. And uh, you'll be within the marking scheme. Okay, there's another question. Uh, the question, my question is on the arrangement of authorities, constitutional provision, case law, legal opinion from books and person. Okay, uh, good. Uh, somebody would like to find out uh, how should I present authorities in support of my answer, which one counts first? Uh, should I state constitutional provision first and so on and so forth? Obviously, where the discussion you are doing, we have a relevant constitutional provision. You must state that first. Don't forget we have supremacy of the constitution, isn't it? You have supremacy of the constitution, Article 2, and uh, Article 1, supremacy of the Constitution. So let's keep that uh, uh, in mind. And then, uh, where the, we don't have constitutional provision, but we have a, a legislation, like an act of parliament, and it's relevant. 
That must also be stated first. Before uh, case law. Now, case law will obviously uh, become more relevant in a typical common law subject areas. If I say typical common law uh, areas, contract, thought. These are like the typical you know, common law areas where the bulk of the law is actually based upon judicial decisions. And we have just a scanty uh, statutory uh, enactments. So let's keep that in mind. Okay, so based upon this, I presume that uh, you are able to uh, try your hands on various uh, problem-based question. And as I said, when you're doing problem-based question in the law school entry examination, keep an open mind. Keep an open mind in a sense that you are doing a composite law paper. You are not, you are, I mean, that is you're doing about six, uh, you are doing a basis, no subject. And uh, unless you are fortunate and in a particular year, the examiner will tell you that uh, identify any uh, course of action from contract law or tort law and possible defenses, then you made your sign of cross because you have been given the, the clue or the area have been delimited for you. But where the question is just open, advise the parties on this. And that is where you need to be careful. Okay, so I have to draw the curtain down and then uh, we meet again. Uh, have a good evening.